appreciate you being here. Um, oh, I got a recording in progress notice. Let me also thank the Center for Hmong Studies. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the few centers of this kind in the entire world. Um, Li Pao, for those of you who may not know Professor Li Pao, he's one of the most uh, foremost experts on Hmong Americans, on Hmong American politics, one of the foremost, uh, most experienced political actors in our community. And so I, I feel um, so, so honored to be uh, invited by the Center for Hmong Studies to um, do a book launch with the Center for uh, Hmong Studies. So thank you, Li Pao. Uh, we, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about my book and also have some fun. So um, I'm hoping to give away, well, not just hoping, I will be giving away uh, two free books to two lucky uh, persons. Um, I will be the uh, third lucky person to give you the, the free book. Um, and that will come at around 625, but I believe uh, my partner will be putting out a link or if she hasn't already in the chat screen. If you could, if you would like to participate in the uh, book giveaway, please click on the link, write your name, last name, and we're gonna do a little spin wheel at around 625. And um, all we ask, all I ask is that the winners contact me to provide me your mailing address so I can mail you your copies, your signed copies. So, Li Pao, I'm gonna turn it back to you and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Li Pao, you may, you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah. Technology, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Xiao. And again, this is uh, uh, a very most interesting book. Uh, lots of uh, useful, relevant information about Hmong American political movement, as well as some good historical background about the immigration uh, process, right? Immigration policies and history. And uh, so what prompted your interest in writing this book, uh, Dr. Yangshan? Okay, okay. And, and how and why did you choose the title? How did you go about doing that? Yeah, I, I apologize for that echo. It looks like um, I, I was having some echo. So I hope you all can hear me okay now. Sure, yeah. Thank you for that question. I, it's, it's, it's a question I've been thinking about. What prompted me to write this book? Well, for one thing, uh, past research in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, especially when they talk about refugees and immigrants from, say, Asia or Southeast Asia and Latin America, have often focused on what happens to immigrants when they arrive in the new country. And so I felt that there, there needs to be more work on, instead of just what happens to them, what do they make happen? What do immigrants and refugees make happen? Some groups like Hmong have been making a lot of things happen. Groups like um, uh, Asian immigrants, Latin American immigrants have made a lot of things happen even before they arrive. And so I wanna look at that. Now, in the last 20, writing in about 20 years ago, political scientists Don Nakanishi and uh, James Lai uh, make the important observation that Asian Americans are emerging as a political force and yet their politics have not received or been systematically studied by either social scientists or politicians. And that's kind of true to some extent, even today. And so, but does that mean Asian Americans are apolitical? No, absolutely not. There is, for example, uh, Asian, uh, uh, in emerging literature on Asian American politics, political activism, there's an emerging literature on Hmong American uh, political activism, uh, civic engagement, but again, few have systematically studied Hmong American social movement. So uh, my book contributes to that new developing, very exciting uh, literature. Um, there's also another reason. Now, some people have claimed, for example, that since the election of uh, President Barack Obama, we now, Americans now live in a so-called post-racial society. Well, I think for one thing, for one thing they, they probably didn't anticipate the election of Donald Trump. 
And um, they probably could define racism in much broader terms. Um, I think the truth is that our society is far, far from this post-racial, whatever that is, society. Many forms of racism exist, continue to exist, continue to impact uh, people, immigrants, minorities, people in general. And so I want to understand how structural racism, how systemic racism continues to um, affect the life chances, opportunities of immigrants and refugees. Uh, I want to understand how non-white, economically vulnerable groups, for example, um, get their grievances heard, and more importantly, how do they get their interests represented in policy? Now, finally, there's, there's this other very, very important thing that I think drove me to write this book, and it has to do with Hmong. It has to do with the fact that they have made tremendous sacrifice, tremendous contributions to this country, uh, and they deserve better. And yet, these, this story, the sacrifice that they've made remain largely unacknowledged, largely unacknowledged. And so to this day, for example, Hmong veterans still are not recognized as veterans. They receive no veterans benefits. Uh, it is as if tens of thousands of Hmong and lives have been lost for this country for nothing. And so, uh, like many, like many um, minority groups, Hmong encounter injustices of all kinds. Like other Asian Americans, for example, Hmong continue to be seen as perpetual foreigners. Like Blacks in our society, Hmong continue to be cast as dangerous. Um, and these representations have consequences for their life chances, for their treatment, for their, uh, their, their ability to affect social policies. And so I also wanted to understand how Hmong, given their racial position in their society, given their economic vulnerabilities, given their lack of resources, how they were able to, in a relatively short period of time, the last 30 or 35 years, uh, occasionally get their interests represented in public policies. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that in general, uh, this story needs to be told and it has been told from in bits and pieces, but I feel that uh, there's a whole lot more to be said. And so some of these things, many of these things are about uh, my, my desire to bring voice to this population, mm -hmm. to their story of sacrifice their story of contributing having contributed to this society yeah okay now um <clears throat> during the process research process with this book i know that you and i we've had numerous exchanges <laughs> on on facebook and uh uh and i all um, you know again i'm always uh, impressed by the amount of information that you were able to uncover uh, from, you know, declassified documents now. And I think, you know, again, within the last several years, four or five years, there've been a lot of stuff that's been disclassified. Uh, what did you learn from, you know, your process of going through this research in, for this book? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I learned that the more I learned, the, the less I kind of know about particular topics, it seems. So the more I've been, you mentioned, Li Pao, about these declassified documents. And even though I've read dozens, if not hundreds of declassified documents on the single topic of Hmong and their uh, participation in the secret war, or the, and more precisely, the US involvement in the secret war in Laos, I realized there's a whole lot that we don't, we still don't know. Mm -hmm. There may be information out there that we still don't know that needs to be known. Uh, needs to be written about. So that's that's one thing I learned in the process of writing that there are questions, more questions that I can ever answer with the kinds of research I've collected. Mm -hmm. I also realized that in the process of writing things like, not just things, but words matter. So as I was trying to decide whether to use phrase like the Hmong secret army or the CIA secret army, I realized no, the, the accurate term is the CIA secret army. I realize it is more balanced to say the American Vietnam War as opposed to just the American War. Um, facts matter too, and evidence matters, um, context matter. And so I tried to um, 
in the in the process understand how context shape political actions on the ground, how they shape decisions, how they shape not just Hmong's uh, opportunity for collective action, but how context, especially broad, uh, multilateral, bilateral political context policies shape the U.S.'s treatment of Hmong mm -hmm. and how those contexts change over time. And these changes sometimes pose as either opportunities or constraints for their action. And so I, I learned um, to think more, more intently about how contexts matter, but also I've learned to think more intently about how, how agency works on the ground and what that means. And maybe part of what that means includes what do people actually do when they begin to frame claims? What kinds of narratives do they draw upon? And so in this book, I write about um, Hmong's collective political narratives, something that I feel previous research hasn't really looked at or looked at closely, but are important for understanding the types of claims that groups like Hmong construct as mm -hmm. they engage in these concrete political struggles. So um, I also learn a great deal about how heart-wrenching it is, how, how sad and how hurtful it is uh, when I hear these stories from veterans from men and women in my own community. And when they articulate the loss of homeland, the loss, the, the, the consequences to them of being stateless refugees, and that has impacted me a great deal too in the process of writing this. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, certainly I have a great deal more to learn about uh, the stories of Hmong and the stories of Hmong refugees and Hmong Americans. Sure. Yeah. And when you, you know, again, when you're collecting information and so on and so forth, what were some aha moments for you? I mean, lots oh. of information. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's a great question. For you to say, wow, you know, wow, you know, I mean, that's yeah. one of the. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I honestly, I, I would tell you that when I talk to Hmong men and women, I have lots and lots of aha moments because I learned so much from them. Um, let me try to think of an aha moment. So most of the history books I've read on Hmong, the Hmong participation in the secret war in Laos have talked about how Hmong were recruited, how they were recruited into the CIA secret army. Few of them have talked about the reasons why, at least from the standpoint of the US government, why Hmong were recruited. Mm -hmm. And so one of the aha moments I had when I was reading through and um, just reading through endless amounts of declassified documents, I realized, hey, actually, I think I've come across a discovery about the reasons why. And in this book, I talk about four of the reasons that came out of the declassified documents that were pretty explicitly stated about why, from the US standpoint, they recruited Hmong. And I will tell you, not to spoil the book, it doesn't have to do with Hmong being warriors. It doesn't have to do with Hmong's long, so-called long-standing animosity against Vietnamese. It has to do with something else. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to do, for example, with Hmong lives being seen as cheap or extremely cheap. It also has to do with Hmong uh, being in the geographic areas that they were far removed from the centers of uh, Laotian power, which was in Vientiane. It had to do with the fact that Hmong were a sizable group, large enough to be an effective army, but not so large that they could go out of control, so large that they could no longer be commanded and controlled by the U.S. government. And so it had to do with these reasons that I got documented in this um, book. Another aha moment, I would say, is, um, you know, when, when I, after analyzing several social movements, I realized, hey, in every, almost every single mo movement, there seems to be a moment where the state, either states like California or the federal government decides, let's do something for Hmong. And then being the skeptic that I am, I ask, do they really decide this out of their own good heart? Or what did it have more to do with the fact that it converges with the state's interests? And my conclusion has been, well, it seems to me pretty clear that oftentimes the state only concedes or, or provides limited concessions to groups like Hmong when it is in the state's interest. Mm. 
And this isn't, of course, this idea of interest convergence didn't, uh, isn't new. It came from Professor Derek Bill, who talks about the insight of um, interest convergence. Uh, but this, these were aha moments for me to see it at work, at play, that it was happening to Hmong too. So these are uh, some examples of many aha moments I had. There's new information coming out every day. I mean, just like yesterday, we were just talking about a, a new report <laughs> that we uncover from the Mac Thompson collection. It's like, wow, you know, a lot of information that reinforces and other times new information injecting into it. If you had to do it all over again, if you had to write this book all over again, uh, what would you change? If I had to write this book all over again, that would be a lot of work, Lee Powell, but um, <laughs> I, I, maybe one thing I would change is I would love to add more photographs. And I, I wasn't able to in this book because, um, because of limitations with publishing charts and tables and maps. And I had approached the max number of uh, illustrations that my publisher gave me. But I think there's a lot of power. There's a lot of um, good thing when we see images of people's faces and people's struggles and people's story so that's one thing i wish i had been able to do and had i been given more space i would have loved to include things like photographs of Hmong women photographs of Hmong men in laos or as refugees i would have also liked to include certificates of veterans or mm -hmm. uh, certificates that they've earned in the process of serving their country or the u.s i would have liked to include documents from congress that recognize at least uh, symbolically veterans, um, Hmong veteran service to our country. So mm -hmm. I wish I had more room to, to include illustrations, more illustrations, photographs, things like that. Yeah, I noticed uh, no photographs in here. So lots of yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, who were the primary audience for this book? When, when you were writing this, who were you writing it uh, for? When I was writing this, I had in mind a lot of people, but I, at the end of the day, I, I, I hold myself accountable to the people I write about. And so I was writing with uh, Hmong refugees and their children in mind. I was writing about uh, this story with them, as well as students in general, the kinds of students that I teach, uh, and some of whom, many of whom are here tonight. Uh, so my students in my Hmong American Experiences course, students in my Hmong American Social Movements course, but of course I was also thinking about other social scientists, uh, historians, sociologists, political scientists who have been for uh, quite some time helping us to understand the political experiences, the political struggles of minorities and of immigrants. So I had them in mind too. I had also social movement activists in mind who uh, who are highly, highly intelligent, courageous, imaginative, and who are out there in the field trying to figure these things out. And, uh, and many times they have figured things out. Uh, and so I write with uh, them in mind as well. Mm -hmm. I also, I think deep down, write with the government or the state in mind. I think that Hmong stories, and the stories of immigrants and refugees are so important, so crucial that somebody, especially people in positions of power, need to hear these stories more than anybody else. They need to hear the kinds of mistreatment that our government has um, uh, inflicted upon groups like Hmong. Uh, and so those are some of the some of the uh, audiences I think about when I write. OK, OK. Yeah, because oftentimes I, I hear, you know, whether it's students or community groups, and they said it's too complex for them to read. <laughs> and so it's designed for academic, uh, for the world of academia, and it's not really for community. So I'm just thinking from a social scientist like yourself, <laughs> thinking about John McKnight, the uh, words about, you know, speaking the language of community versus the language of institutions. And so that's often what I hear from um, uh, the people that I interact with out there. That's what I asked the question. Thank you. Absolutely. No, that, that's, <laughs> I think I, I, I will uh, myself try to uh, write more in that manner so that the knowledge that we produce actually has uh, 
practical use. I mean, it would be my book would be uh, useless if it just sits on a library shelf and nobody can actually use the knowledge there. And so it's it's important, I think, that we are able to speak to, talk about, convey um, to a broad set of audience, certainly. Sure, sure. Now we have a lot of uh, young uh, scholars um, even on here tonight. Uh, yeah. And I know that you have written, you know, book chapters, you have written articles, and now an actual a, a book uh, under your name. What what advice would you give to those who want to put something like this together? <laughs> yeah, I, I would and be... They've never been published before. How do they go about doing that? And what advice would you give them? I would tell them that I'm really, really excited that they are thinking about writing a book or a, uh, even a uh, book chapter or article, but a book especially. I'd be very excited for them. I think that writing is a lot of work, certainly, but writing can also be very liberating. Uh, you get to choose to some extent, um, or to a large extent, I want to say, um, the story you want to tell, the mm -hmm. facts you want to present, the arguments you want to uh, convey, and you, you, have the, you have a lot of say, I think, beyond um, other kinds of works in a book, you can say a lot more, I, be, I think, and it can be liberating in that sense. Another advice I might give is to read a lot of primary sources on topics that you care about, um, topics that may be related to your, uh, to your focus. Um, talk to people, talk to people, talk to people who've written on that topic before. And I, I found those to all be very, very useful uh, as I bounce my ideas off of people who've written on similar things. I realize, hey, we have similar ideas or I realize, hey, actually, I'm making a new contribution here uh, and that's OK. And so uh, I would in general be very excited for them. I, I would encourage them to write because writing can be very liberating. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, your, your book covers both the secret war narrative, uh, race and racism in the US, Hmong American political agency. After reading your book, what would you like Hmong as well as non-Hmong to take away? Yeah, yeah, wow, take away points. I think there's a lot. There's a lot I would like people to take away. Uh, one thing I would certainly like people to take away from my book is that immigrants and refugees deserve better. They deserve better treatment than they receive. Immigrants, refugees, minorities in our society deserve a whole lot better. Another thing I would like people to take away from this book is that immigrants and refugees have agency. If they work together, if they're united on particular causes, uh, if they build trust and solidarity, they can make things happen, mm -hmm. even against or in, in, in situations where seemingly there are odds that can't seem to be overcome. They can overcome. Uh, there has been occasions where they can um, overcome tremendous odds. And so uh, that's another point I'd like people to take away. A third point is, look, racism in so many forms continue to exist and have profound, profound impact on people's lives. There's no denying that. And uh, we wish, I wish I could say racism doesn't exist in the US political system and that the US political system treats groups like Hmong or other racialized groups fairly equally, but I can't say that. Okay. The evidence shows they, they are treated very differently, very unfairly. And so um, there needs to be uh, something done about it, of course, but uh, more work I hope will uh, take race even more seriously, uh, especially systemic racism, especially things like racialization as a process. Um, another thing I'd like people to take away from this book, whether they are Hmong or non-Hmong, is Hmong stories are important. Hmong's narratives are important. Hmong parents and uncles and aunts and their own parents' stories are precious and valuable. And I would like people to pay attention to them and record them, uh, put them in the archives, study them, and take them seriously. Most importantly, take them seriously and uh, realize that these 
stories aren't just stories made up from thin air, but they are stories of people who have lived through, experienced decades of hardship. I think there's a whole lot we can learn from the stories of Hmong and many other uh, groups like them. So those would be some of the things I would hope people take away from this book. Uh, agency, certainly a big deal. Race, but also stories and voices um, are, are really important things that I think we should pay attention to. Okay, thank you. Now you wanna share, we have some time left. You wanna share something from the book? Uh, oh yes, yes. So I, I had wanted to, um, you know, in one of my chapters, Lipel, I, I know we talked a little bit about this. One of my chapters, especially the chapter on Hmong's mobilization for naturalization accommodation. You, you are one of the uh, political actors I mentioned in that chapter. And I make the argument that you were instrumental in the passage of the Hmong Veterans Naturalization Act, because in my, in my opinion, you were. I mean, you took particular actions, you were in a position to, uh, that influenced the outcome of this bill. So, I mean, I guess one of my questions to you would be, could you share a little bit with us, the audience here, um, either what positions you were at that time during the debate about the Hmong Veterans Naturalization Bill and or any kind of memorable experiences you had from that time, Li Pao? Sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> turning the table to me now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the Mo Naturalization Act, you know, it started out in, in the early days, right, in, in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I remember in 1988, when I worked for United States Senator Carl Levin of Michigan in Washington, D.C., there's been conversation about the Mo Naturalization Act. And at that time, it was the Hmong Veterans Act, right? And so the Law Veterans of America has been pushing and they pushed to basically um, ask the United States Congress to give them, you know, if, at first it's about benefits, right? It's about benefits. And then later on, it became about naturalization. And uh, so also at that time, maybe controversial, but uh, Congressman Bruce Vento was a good friend of mine. And he said that people were selling positions and ranks and, and making all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, I would say statements about the fact that, you know, join our group or you won't get this, you won't get benefits and all that. So he changed it to Mo Naturalization Act instead of Mo Veterans Act. <laughs> so, so he told us that I changed it to uh, Naturalization Act because it's all about, uh, it's all about um, uh, granting, uh, helping with the naturalization process. So uh, every year, you know, it kind of pushed through the, the uh, Congress, basically the House, and it would pass the House and it would die in, in the Senate, or it wouldn't, it wouldn't even be, get, a, get a hearing in the Senate, right? And so um, one year, uh, I, when I was, uh, again, on the, appointed as a commissioner for the President Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islander under President Clinton, um, I was there at the right time in the right place, right? So when Clinton, even uh, when uh, Clinton invited me to the White House and I met with him, uh, you know, uh, they said, well, the president would like to meet with you. And I said, about what? About anything that you want to talk about. <laughs> so, so I was like, oh, that's, that's a big thing, you know? So I, I uh, brought to President Clinton's attention the uh, mental health issues within our community, uh, juvenile delinquency issue within the community, and about the Moan Naturalization, uh, Naturalization Act. And I said, you know, uh, uh, President, I mean, uh, Congressman Bruce uh, Vento has been pushing this bill uh, to try to secure some sort of benefits for Hmong veterans and particularly under the citizenship arena. And uh, so if the bill reaches your office, you should definitely sign. And, and it's kind of interesting, the statement we were meeting at the White House and he said, so I, I've seen uh, all these uh, Asians with uh, army fatigue down there is that what that is that what that's all about and i say yeah that's that's what that's all about and uh so afterward you know of course he appointed me to the commission and uh so we were meeting in washington dc one one day and uh i got a call from uh, the st paul pioneer press reporter that said you know the the bill passed the um the house i mean the, the house are you are you excited i said it passed the house several times in the past the problem is, you know, it needs to go through the Senate as well 
and Senator Paul Wellstone was the author, the chief author in the Senate. And so um, we need to get Senator Paul Wellstone to introduce the legislation. Uh, otherwise the house, it's just gonna die again, right? And so uh, as a result of that, I, I said, you know, let me, let me call Senator Wellstone's office. So it's, you know, we're fortunate in that we have, we have people in those offices who are Hmong. And, uh, and we have relationship with them because I worked with her, uh, Ia Xiong, uh, uh, Senator Paul Wellstone's staff, uh, when I was at the Urban Coalition. And I was at, at that time, I was the presidency of the Urban Coalition. And so she said, oh yeah, it passed. Okay, let me see if I can get the uh, Senator to fast track it. Did you know whether it was controversial or not? I'd say non-controversial. And so she basically got the Senator to fast track it. And the fast tracking the bill mean it bypassed all of the committee because there's no controversies. And so it went straight to the, to the Senate floor and uh, for a vote. And so uh, that, passed the, the bill passed both both chamber so we were meeting in washington dc uh, uh i think it was like a month or so later or so uh not, not a month or so later i mean uh we were still there that week and i got a call from uh, laura eford who was the uh, uh assistant to uh, the president and she said the how the uh Mo naturalization act uh reached the president's office what would you like the president to do, you know? And uh, so I said, sign it. <laughs> because I said, first of all, at that time, Congressman Bruce Vento was dying from cancer, okay? And uh, so uh, sign it. Uh, plus it doesn't even guarantee citizenship for Hmong. Uh, it only asks that they be allowed to bring a interpreter into the examination room. So I said, if the president's gonna sign it, then uh, wait until uh, uh, I call all the veterans and we can all be in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, sign the legislation, you know, with, with all the veterans standing behind the president. And, uh, but unfortunately, you know, again, it's, it could be extremely controversial, right? Because if you give it to the Hmong, what about the other groups that the Americans have been involved in? So uh, this was like 10, 10 o'clock or so. And then about one o'clock or so, the uh, Laura Efer called back and said, the president signed the legislation. I said, okay, that's great. <laughs> if he doesn't want the veterans, that's okay, as long as we have the bill signed. And so I think it was just, again, uh, being there the right time at the mo right moment with the right people. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I don't know if the, what the president would have done if I was not there, uh, if they didn't seek my consultation, maybe he could, he would have signed it anyways, but, Again, at that time, we had that relationship uh, with uh, the White House and uh, because of my, my, my role there. So yeah, that's, it's, but prior to that, you know, it's kind of interesting. There were a lot of controversies, but uh, I, I told many of those groups that, you know, uh, don't do anything, <laughs> just, uh, just stay put and don't do anything. And, uh, but I'm glad the president signed. And because of that, um, uh, because of that, I think the, the, uh, uh, many of our veterans uh, were able to obtain citizenship, uh, being able to test, to, to go through the citizenship test in their native language using the interpreter. So, yeah. Thank you, Lipel. Thank you for sharing that, um, that very, very remarkable experience. And what you did, I think, was quite, quite remarkable. Mm. Uh, so I wrote, I tried to reconstruct that um, in my books to give us a better understanding of how the Hmong veterans Naturalization Act came to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that is to say, thank you, Lipao, for your service to our country. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, again, uh, as I mentioned to President Clinton, I mean, when I first met with him, and somebody asked a question, how did I get to that point <laughs> uh, to be appointed to uh, president? And I think I was very active. You know, I was the uh, director of the State Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. And then prior to that, I was the executive director of Moment Partnership. So I did a lot of work in Washington, D.C. And uh, in terms of policy, like you know, welfare reforms, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, immigration reforms, and so and, and, and social justice issue, right? So um, because of that, you know, people uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, like Karen Narsaki, uh, whom I highly respect, um, she was one of the individuals. I understand she was one of the individuals that nominated my name, and that's yeah. why you know, again, during that week. I was on vacation up north and I just got a call from my secretary here at Concordia and said, somebody from the White House is calling, looking for you. I'm like, 
who? You know? <laughs> so he gave me the phone number. I called and Laura Eford and Laura Eford just basically said, the president would like to meet with you. And I think it was a way for him to screen me, you know? And uh, so I said, okay, president would like to meet with me. What would he like to meet with me about? And say, well, talk about any issues that you think, you know, it's, uh, that would be relevant for your community, right? And so that's what I, I kind of thought about and said, okay, what are some of the hot topics right now? The issues of mental health, the issues of children now delinquency at that time, and then the Mo Naturalization Act. So I picked those three points, I mean, out of, you know, just based on my experience in working in the community. And uh, so I brought those issues up to him. And it's kind of interesting when I brought up the mental health issue. I mean, I, I, I thank America. I said, thank you, America. And thank you, the United States. Thanks to the United States of America for opening your door to bring us here. But you forget that we came from a war-torn country, right? We came from a war-torn country. And uh, so your, your GIs came home with PTSD. Our community, our veterans, my parents came here with PTSD. <laughs> and so mental health, and so now they have roof over their heads and food on the table. Now they're thinking back, how come my parents are not here to enjoy it with me? How come my siblings are not here to enjoy it with me because they died trying to escape or they died during the war, right? So when you have food to eat, you start thinking. <laughs> you don't focus on living, but you start thinking about you know, regrets, right? And, and anger. And so I said, you know, for example, Kwa Ho, you know, she killed six of her children. And he actually said, Oh yeah, I heard about that. You know, he said, I heard about that. And uh, that's very tragic. So it's interesting that he heard about that. And then I said, you know, I talked about the population of Hmong in China also. I said, you know, the Hmong are spread throughout the world. And there's about, I think at that time I said about 200,000 Hmong in the United States uh, and about 8 million or so Hmong in China. And he said, how many in China? And I said, yeah, we have that. So we started talking about U.S. policy, he says, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, United States, you know, some people in Congress were looking for an, an, a new enemy. And it seems China was that new enemy. That's what this is coming from him. And he said, but I don't believe so. I think that China could be our greatest partner. And so I said, you know, one of the things that we need to do is to utilize and take advantage of the people that are here. Right to build relationship with those countries, and so we talked about that. But yeah, that that's how you know. I think it's through my advocacy work and policy work that uh, elevated my name to the, the point where the president actually was interested in in my okay. candidacy. <laughs> Thank you, Li Pao, for sharing that. For those of you who may not know uh, Professor Li Pao well, he's one of the most humble public servants I know, and. I know a few things about U.S. politics and Hmong American politics. If I know a few things about it, Li Pao knows 10,000 things about it. And so Li Pao, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Should we go to Q&A now? Sure, yeah, we have 15 minutes left. And again, we, yeah. we were scheduled until 6.30. So, uh, you know, it's Friday night. I know you probably want to go somewhere or if you have nothing to do, I'm, I'm not only back. I, I want to be here. <laughs> I want to be here. So I want to be respectful of people's time as well. But you're you're free to leave after the time is up. Uh, and uh, but otherwise, if you want to sit around and chat and continue to chat. We can certainly do that as well. So any questions from anybody? I mean, uh, questions, comments, anything, observations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll start. It seems like people might fight after a while. So I, uh, no way, I just want to say. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to say, uh, again, reiterating what Yang Xiao has said, you know, Li Pao, you have really spearheaded so much and the efforts to archive things. Uh, because as I often say, you know, Yang Xiao, right, if it's not archived, if it's not preserved, then it's almost as if it didn't exist. And so I, I'm so looking forward to reading your book, Yang Xiao. I know you've been um, really, really at the forefront of studying social movements. And so I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And I also love what you said about, you know, state interest, right? So often we, we are so grateful. We are grateful refugees and that's a fact. But at the same time, um, we, we give so much and, and often the, the, the acts of the state is not almost reflective of something altruistic, but more so about what is in the state's interest. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I really am looking forward to reading the book. And I, I know, I think one person asked about the, um, the Hmong secret army and the CIA secret army. 
I, I don't want to steal her question, but that was one thing I was writing about too. And as you know, I, I've been writing about these things for a long time too. And I, I really like the fact that you talked about, you know, why Hmong were recruited. And those are, I mean, the, the idea of cheap Hmong lives. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's something that we often don't talk about, right? We, we only talk about these people coming to save us. But, but there are so many other ways to interpret. It's colonial, it's imperial, there's all those other aspects. If you don't mind sharing a little bit about that component, because I really think that's a wonderful contribution. Thank you so much, Dr. Chair. I appreciate your question so much and your comments too. I uh, look forward to more conversations with you on my book. Uh, the question of Hmong lives being considered cheap or very cheap and I, in this book, I point out that through declassified documents, I, I come to that conclusion. I come to that conclusion also by, you know, asking and talking to veterans who tell me that during throughout the war, they were making, if they were paid at all, they were making about a dollar fifty per per month to about three dollars per month, as compared to American privates, uh, unranked pri soldiers who were paid anywhere between seven dollars and eleven dollars a day that's a difference of more than 10 times um, the 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 worth now it's not just privates who are paid differently uh, if we look at majors colonels pilots and i know dr chair just wrote a book on uh, monk pilots too when you compare monk pilots income of say a hundred or two hundred dollars a month to four to five thousand a month that was paid to American pilots in Laos doing the same things. In fact, not quite the same things because Hmong pilots were flying thousands of bombing missions. Mm -hmm. Then you clearly see uh, how Hmong lives were valued or devalued. In fact, there's also language in declassified documents that talk about how much the U.S. how much bang for a buck the U.S. was getting in Laos for the same amount of money they were spending in Laos, they were getting a whole lot more done. That is killing a whole lot more enemies compared to what was happening in Vietnam. And so these language points to how little Hmong lives were valued. Um, I know you also raised the question I see in the chat too. I want to uh, go to Cal's question about words and why they matter. I've chosen in this book to write about the CIA secret army and to try to be consistent with that instead of the Hmong secret army or Hmong secret army, because it was the CIA secret army. It was the CIA that organized, orchestrated, planned, commanded this secret army. It wasn't Hmong. It wasn't Hmong who, re, uh, who, who ordered things to be done. It was the CIA. And so uh, there's a huge difference when we write about whether we say a Hmong, Hmong secret army or the CIA secret army, whether we call it the CIA secret war or Hmong secret war. And I prefer to call it the CIA secret war in Laos or the America secret war in Laos. Um, and so these imply particular understandings of history and fact. And I think the latter, the CIA secret army, the CIA's secret war are much more factually accurate compared to the former. Uh, so that's what I would I would say initially, and there's a whole lot more in the book that answers uh, those types of questions. Um, so yeah, let me see if there's another question in the chat. I, I do see another question from, let me see. Lipao, do you have other questions or do you see other questions that I'm missing? I see a question from Lynette, let me, let me see. Jumping forward, what is the most significant, Lynette asks, Jumping forward to 2020, what is the most significant movement issue for Hmong, especially Hmong women in the United States now? I think that's such a crucial question. Thank you, uh, Professor Utah. Okay. Um, what is the most significant movement issue for Hmong, especially Hmong women? I don't want to pretend that I know what's, what's the most urgent or significant for Hmong women. I don't speak for them, but I certainly see uh, various issues dealing with inequalities, perhaps inequalities of pay, inequalities of treatment uh, that Hmong women and other uh, women in general care deeply about. 
Um, they care about equality, like many, many other people rightfully care about. Uh, they care about representation and voice, representation, especially in uh, electoral systems, in the political system. Uh, we need more voices from Hmong American women. And Hmong American women have been at the forefront of many of these social movements, um, but they're still uh, fighting for representation, voice, to be at the table so that they can make decisions. I think in the years to come, we're going to continue to see those kinds of struggles and fights. Um, and I hope that the community will um, unite, be in solidarity with these struggles. Mm -hmm. Another question from Mao Li. Um, I wonder if you could please share more on why you chose this particular photo for your book cover. Oh, yes, yeah, something I forgot to, and I want to put a shout out to Mr. Va Meng Mo. I don't know if, is, if he's here, but I got this photograph from Mr. Va Meng Mo, who's the editor of Hmong Today, who graciously gave me permission to use it for free on my book cover. It's a photo, photograph of one of the moments during the uh, arrest of General Vang Pao, where I believe all charges were dropped against General Vang Pao. Um, around 2010 or so, 2009, 2010, and people celebrated. It was a moment that uh, I could not find anywhere else. And I, I thought that this highlighted the kinds of unity, the kinds of um, passion, collective action and representation that I would like my book to um, be about. And so I chose that photograph and Mr. Moa, but Ming Moa was so kind to let me use it. Yeah. Let me pause there and see if there are other questions from uh, other people. There's a question from Stephen, right? Yeah, let me let me see. Uh, Dr. Stephen Bright says, do you feel that for older Hmong Americans in particular, people are people see exercising agency as meaning their political concerns are voice articulated or that the pressing social needs um, are met? I do understand there is an intersection and that one doesn't preclude the other. I'm trying to understand whether there is a press for political presence for the community among the leaders. I believe this was the case with elder African American Southerners coming out of Jim Crow, um, et cetera. That's a hard, that, that's a very, very thoughtful, meaningful question. For older Hmong Americans in particular, um, how do they see agency? Um, I'm going to have to give this more thought. I mean, they certainly have, older Hmong Americans see a great, great deal of, um, let me see, let me give this some more thought. I, I, I don't want to provide a, uh, an answer that is, that would be unfair to, I think my elders, but Yeah. Any other hey, questions? Can, can can I ask a question? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. My name is Tu Yevu, and I just want to say that you know, really great talk today, Xiao. Uh, Thank you. So Xiao and I are actually undergraduate at the University of California Davis together. We lived together as roommates, and I don't really remember the last time we had a conversation. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, Thank you so for I'm being actually, here. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm the only Mo person perhaps at the University of New Mexico, my faculty over here uh, in neuroscience. And so I'm really happy to be here to, to talk about Hmong stuff, to hear about Hmong stuff, because I never get to do that being so far away from the Hmong <laughs> community. And so, you know, and then hearing about what you talk about, how cheap Hmong lives were viewed at the time was actually like really hard to hear for somebody, you know, growing up Hmong and seeing how our parents suffered, you know. And so, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I got a little, even a little emotional thinking about it. But my question to you is, you know, uh, given even how the U.S. may have viewed Hmong people at the time, could you speak a little bit about the mindset of Hmong leaders at the time? And, you know, I, I, I wonder if you actually talk to them or, you know, read some stuff about them to know why they decided to participate in the war to bring Hmong people to be a part of it. And in your opinion, despite we being taken advantage of the hardship that we experience, you know, as a result of the consequence of the war and eventually, you know, the hardship that we experienced in America, 
was it the right decision? Was it worth it for Hmong people to participate coming from the perspective of the Hmong leader at the time? And today you thinking about it, you know, in our position today, the opportunities that maybe we enjoy too, what do you think? Was it worth it for Hmong people to participate, to be taken advantage of and to be pulled into the modern era of political you know, influence and stuff? So I just wonder what you take on that. Thank you so much. I, I think it's never worth it to be taken advantage of. It's never worth it to be dying in the tens of thousands. It's never worth it to be manipulated to fight against your own countrymen. Um, I, 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 would, I wouldn't have a clear answer, but my answer would be, I don't think war is ever worth it. I don't think dying in tens of thousands is ever worth any um, much. That's what I would say. Had Mo known that they were uh, going to be dying in the tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand, I am pretty, pretty sure um, young and old would know in their heart it's not worth it. They would rather choose peace. They would rather live in peace. Yes, they may be economically poor, but they would have each other. I don't think anybody would choose war, or choose to go to war. Um, and so that would be my short answer to, uh, to you, to yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to um, uh, Steve, Stephen's question on what agency means. And I think that agency for Hmong certainly means both Get, getting their voices heard, making sure that their voices are taken seriously, but even more importantly, that they get and obtain tangible resources and substantive representation, not just symbolic representation. I think too often Hmong elders, Hmong youngsters, uh, where they fight very hard and what they get is symbolic, symbolic concessions or symbolic inclusion and what they're really wanting is of course for their concerns to be addressed for their needs to be met they want tangible resources but in this book i argue they also are fighting for political standing they're fighting for um to be seen as worthy and valuable people um and oftentimes it, they go both go in hand in hand so agency i think to many Hmong elders mean both getting their voices heard, not just being heard, but taken seriously. And what that means is eventually making sure that the state does provide them with concrete, tangible resources, rights, and representation. That's what I think. But again, I, I, uh, I would welcome other thoughts um, and other uh, comments on that too. Yeah, Shao, could I ask the question? Please, please. So first of all, I just want to congratulate you on my toast. Where's my Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on the uh, on the book and, and <clears throat> much to uh, congratulations and uh, respect. So thank my you. question is related to, you know, for many of us younger generation, we sometimes think of our elders, especially um, like, uh, you know, they're uneducated. We think that and we think that, you know, they didn't go to schooling. So but yet they're able to pull off all these amazing things like start Lao family, organize like the Freedom Festival that's been almost 40 years in St. Paul, right? <clears throat> or get things done in this clan structure that even to me baffles how they could do that, right? Organize these festivals with, again, with you know not a college degree. Do you feel that our younger generation still has that capability to do some of those things because it really <clears throat> showed itself when General Vang Pao and, and those were arrested and throughout the nation these organized events took place right <clears throat> you do you think that if let's say Lee Paul Shong gets arrested and can we galvanize riot uh not riot demonstrations to uh speak on behalf of Lee Paul let's hope so Peng. <laughs> great question Peng. thank you um I, I was at the uh, General Vang Pao's, uh, the protest against the arrest of General Vang Pao for a number of days. And I saw Hmong American youth, uh, many, many of them were there alongside their parents, aunts and uncles. And it gives me tremendous hope. And I see the future um, being Hmong American youth, college educated men and women, especially being actively involved um, in and they have, I mean, it's not just a future thing. They have, we've seen them involved in many 
important social movements throughout Hmong American history, and they continue to be at the forefront of many of these um, uh, social movements. So certainly, I think Hmong American youth are highly capable, highly intelligent, imaginative, creative, and I, I continue to expect them to be at the forefront of many of these uh, social movements. Uh, if anybody were to get arrested, I, I would anticipate Hmong, college educated Hmong American youth, men and women will be there. Not you, men and men and women. Um, I think that ties in with my C's question here. Uh, yeah, what lessons say, do yeah. you think? <laughs> yeah, what lessons do you think today's youth can learn from Hmong American movements and our current intersectional efforts for justice? What can we learn? Uh, one lesson they can learn is that stories are important. Narratives, collective narratives, are important. We can't always. Uh, make up narratives. Narratives have to have certain bases sometimes for them to be effective. Uh, if we can find a way to uh, draw upon narratives, including narratives from the civil rights era, narratives from Hmong, narratives from other groups, I think we can go far in terms of making potentially strategic claims. There's a great deal more work to be done. I think another lesson is how do we work together across groups? How do Hmong work across groups between Hmong and other immigrants and refugee groups? How do Hmong work with Blacks? How do Hmong work with other Asian and other Hispanic groups? And I think that needs a lot more research too, but research has shown that there are times when groups come together and they're able to get a lot of things done. In, in the cases that I study here, Hmong sought support from organizations like the Asian Law Caucus, and they in fact received substantial support um, and it helped them, it helped their movement become successful. So that too, the, the idea of working across communities, working across organizations is another lesson that I think we can learn. Um, and then how do we continue to use and design new kinds of repertoires, kinds of tactics against a very volatile, uh, frequently changing context. There's always gonna be new political context, new political opportunities, new political uh, threats. How do we respond to them in ways that are uh, effective? I think that's, that's gonna depend a lot on getting together and thinking and strategizing. So I think, I think those are at least some of the lessons that more American uh, younger folks or young people can learn. Um, there's a question for Chai, and I think Dr. Sure. Chow, you you uh, address this in your book about uh, AB 78 issue. That's you right. Know, that's right. That. <laughs> I think the question was uh, collectively what insights you've learned about and from AB 78 issue that authored the assembly by Assembly uh, Bill Sarah Reyes. Yes. Okay. What insights have you learned about? Hmm. A lot, a lot. It's hard for me to summarize it in one, one minute, but I've learned that Hmong American women professionals, especially in that movement, led a very powerful movement. It started out with the media constructing these uh, teenage suicides as, an, as a cultural collision issue. And Hmong partly appropriated that narrative, but they also resisted that narrative and they went the other way. They decided, hey, look, in fact, in fact, it may have a lot to do with Hmong being marginalized, and that's why we are now asking for representation in the schools. And so, in a nutshell, they turn a cultural collision argument into something quite different about the lack of Hmong representation, about the marginalization of Hmong, about racial discrimination, and they were able to, in the process, um, build a movement to the point where they successfully got AB 78 to pass. And um, I know I don't have time to mention some of the actors and actresses here, but they are in this room. They're in this room. And I hope that we'll have many more conversations with them because they were the ones at the forefront. And so they would know best uh, what are some of the lessons we could learn from that movement, the AB 78 movement. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me see. I think we're at six. 37. <laughs> I know I promised to do a raffle. Yes, so yes. let's do a raffle and see uh, um, who who wins two books. Yeah. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Mary, would you please? Uh, Mary is my uh, lovely wife. 
if in case you don't know. So Mary's going to help me um, uh, do the wheel spin, share screen, and we're going to pick two persons. All right, she's put all together the names of people who had, yeah. Spin away. <laughs> Who is a uh... okay? Yeah, 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 it looks like, is that the first winner? I, I went offline for a little bit, so is that the first winner? The other one is Yang Shang. Is that you, Dr. Yang Shang, the first one? <laughs> Did I win my own book? <laughs> <laughs> and then the second one is, uh, it's a Ping Her. It's a Ping hey, Congratulations. I'm Yang Shang. Yang Shang, that's my brother. Okay, okay. Yang Shang. Yes. Okay. He's, your, he's your brother. I don't know if you want to give up or... <laughs> of course. He's my good brother. I will, of course. Um... <laughs> Thank you so much. So, so we have two winners. We have my brother Yang Zong and my brother Peng He. So, um, right. if you could please, the two of you, whenever you can, um, text, uh, email me your addresses. I will. I would be so honored to sign and send you a copy of my book. All right. So All right. We're, Back to Q and A. Yep. Will do. Thank you. I know we are at uh, six thirty nine. Yes. So. Um, Let's see if we have any more questions we can answer. Otherwise, uh, yeah. you know, again, you know, we can conclude tonight's session. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, from Brandon. Uh, Brandon said, you, referen you referenced uh, Benedict Anderson's uh, imagined com communities. The Hmong are without a nation state and is and its diaspora is worldwide. Yet being Hmongness for the cultural traits of being a proud Hmong is internally perpetuated and expressed by Hmong people. How do you explain a group of people with share historical and cultural traits, yet without a nation, is surviving and thriving in the host nation? Man, that's a hard question. Yeah, that's a big that's question. A question. <laughs> that's a very important question, but a hard question. I don't know if I can answer that, but I don't. I know that Hmong have for a very long time. Um, wanted a country and they still many groups still do and i think they do it for uh important reasons they they do it out the out of the sense that they have been deprived of state protection for a very long time Hmong have this strong yearning for equal state treatment equal state protection and uh they talk about how they are a, a stateless people without a country and there's currently all over the place talks about standardization among language, standardization among writing, all of this go back to the idea of who Hmong are as an ethnic group or who they could become. Um, where am I going with this? I, I think this is a hard question. I think that um, many people have written about Hmong identity and how that's changing. Um, many Hmong have talked a great deal or thought a great deal about the Hmong diaspora, and they're talking about Hmong in the US, France, Australia, or people outside of the continent of Asia, and what the future may hold for the kinds of relationships across in uh, across these national boundaries. I don't, I, I don't have the answer either. I think that in the future, we'll continue to see as technology allows and as transportation allows, we'll continue to see more frequent interactions between and among Hmong of different communities. And that may determine the future identity, whatever that may be. It may be male, it may be Hmong, it may be some other identity that the collective uh, agree on. I, I, I don't have a good sense of what that might be. I know, do know that the term HMONG means a lot to Hmong Americans because uh, this is a term that was very hard uh, won. Uh, it, people had to fight for it and they were able to win it and it has only been in, 
in existence for um, so long. And so this is a term dear to their heart. Now, how might this term, this label change in the next couple of decades? I'm not quite sure. So again, it's it's a question, a very important question, a very interesting question that deserves a great deal more discussion and debate. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? I know I'm looking at clock at six forty-two. They turn off all the lights in the library here already. <laughs> they close at six. <laughs> but anyways, we'll be you know it's up to if you have more questions, just go ahead and um, uh, drop them in the chat here. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for. Um, for joining us tonight. I mean, so it's it's a wonderful uh, to see all of you uh, and haven't seen most of you for the longest time. So <laughs> uh, wonderful to see all of you. And again, make sure you join us next, uh, our next session, which will be April 15th, Friday, April 15th from 5.30 uh, to 6.30 as well. And this will be with Dr. De Cha, who is also in here tonight. And she will be talking about Queen, her latest book, Queen of Needlework. And if this will give you more time to go out there and run and get the book. Uh, and as for Dr. Ying Shao's book, where can they find this, Dr. Ying Shao? I think uh, uh, they already posted the link in there, but I think Mo ABC also carries it. And so if you look in the Twin mm -hmm. Cities, you can certainly uh, go and grab it as well. Absolutely. You can find it at Rutgers University Press. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Mo ABC. Uh, you could contact me. I, I'd be happy to also uh, point you to other places. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I appreciate your uh, presence a great deal. Uh, I think, I think Gauli, you have a question? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm with Dr. Gauli from Fresno. <laughs> so I need to advertise, do an advertisement. April 29, we will have Yashao at Fresno State with us. And I and Brandon, where's Brandon? Brandon and I will host Yashao. So we will have also a book conversation with this book as well, just wonderful. to let you know. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. So if you missed uh, the opportunity tonight and your friends couldn't join us tonight, let them know about the next one <laughs> down in Fresno State. So thank Can you. Can you type that in the chat, Charlie? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Can you put it on the chat when, when it will be? Okay. Okay, right away. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, right, nice to see everybody. Yes. All right. Thank you. Good to see you, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. All right. So with that, uh, thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing most of you. Uh, April 15th. Thank you. I, ju I just put my email. So email me for the link, the Zoom link. Okay. April 29th. So April 29th. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yoli. Where's the email? Sorry, I'm typing. <laughs> so it should be in the link. Thank you. Okay, here you go. So you can email me, so I will send you the link. Thank you, that was very interesting. All right, thank you. Good to see everybody, have a good night and have a great thank weekend. You. Thank you. Hey, Xiao, you can see it. You can see it, you can see it, you can yeah, take care.